one. Good morning, everyone. Michelle Riley here with Notaries for Alabama. And our special guest today is Rich Bradley. He is with MSPA of the Americas. This webinar is for notaries to consider uh, an alternate stream of income. Um, I'm a former mystery shopper. I did it. I got started back in 2007 and I loved it. I found that it fit real nicely with my mobile notary business and signing agent business. And when those appointments slowed down, there was plenty of mystery shopping appointments or assignments for me to fill in the gaps. So that is why I asked Rich Bradley to join us. Um, Rich will talk more about the association, but this is an association I've been very familiar with, very trustworthy. And as some of you know, who are members of my Facebook group, I had begun picking up some um, strange information on the internet about mystery shopping. And I'm a person, I go right to the source. So for the next hour, we're gonna let Rich talk about the association, about the role of mystery shoppers, and then answer your questions. Um, Carla, Cynthia, Maisha, if you would, if your microphones aren't muted, go ahead and mute for right now, and then Rich will let us know um, how he wants to handle questions. Take it away, Rich. Okay, thanks, Michelle, and thanks everybody for attending. Um, while I'm giving a little bit of background, Michelle, can you go ahead and enable my ability to share screen? You might need to make me a co-host to do that. I'm not sure. Yeah, perfect. We've got it. Okay. So um, again, uh, as Michelle said, my name is Rich Bradley <clears throat> and I'm with a company called Buena Vista Events and Management and we manage the day-to-day -day operations for MSPA Americas, which is the official trade association for the customer experience industry in uh, the Western Hemisphere. We have sister chapters in Europe and Asia Pacific. Uh, so there are three total MSPA units around the world. <clears throat> Ours is the first, the original, the other two spun off of that. And so today what I'm gonna do is share with you a little bit about how mystery shopping as an industry got started, what it's all about, what it looks like to be a mystery shopper, what to be careful of, what makes a good shopper and what doesn't. Um, and then some information in the end that if you would like to pick up some mystery shopping gigs on the side, how you would go about doing that and doing that in a safe way, because it is certainly, um, as Michelle kind of referenced, it's definitely an industry that scammers like to target. Um, so it, it's, it's very legitimate. It's been around 80 years, but you want to make sure that if you decide to jump into it, that you jump in um, at, at the right places. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up a PowerPoint here that I have. Whoops, we're already back. Okay, everybody uh, see the uh, PowerPoint? Yes, okay. I can see it clearly. Okay, perfect, okay. All right, so what is mystery shopping is kind of how we'll get started on this. It's a legitimate industry with an 80 year history, started in 1940, which we'll talk about here in a second. Very important market research tool used all over the world in pretty much every industry you can think of. A great side gig for, uh, for the right people. And we'll explain what makes a good mystery shopper. It's not for everybody. Now, what it is not, it's not a get-rich-quick scheme. In fact, some of the projects uh, don't even pay, but, um, but there are reimbursements and experiences. Some of them do pay. Some of them pay decently. Some of them pay a, a marginal thing, but the benefit is, uh, is really the advantage there. And uh, it's, it's not a phone-it-in kind of easy side hustle. Um, people's jobs can be uh, affected by 
the report that you give. Um, it's, it's something that you really need to take seriously each and every project if you take it on. So it's, it's not, definitely not a phone it in kind of thing. So as I mentioned, mystery shopping actually started by, was started by the Macy's Corporation in the 1940s. And it was started not so much about custom, to, to measure customer experience, but to measure loss prevention. So what they did was they, uh, they had hired people to pretend to be shoppers who were really more security people uh, going through the store and just making sure that as best as they could that uh, shoplifting wasn't going on. Um, so it really didn't start in terms of customer experience. It really started in terms of loss prevention, but it very quickly evolved into taking people pretending to be shoppers and having them measure key elements to success for a store, like customer experiences with their employees, like cleanliness, uh, order in the store, things being in the place that the right places in the right departments that they were supposed to be. And, and basically, um, it became a pretty important tool over the years to ensure that things were operating to the maximum efficiency over, uh, over the course of all the operations of, of a retail business. And it's expanded beyond retail to government. Uh, basically, any kind of human interaction uh, can be mystery shopped. And so we'll talk about a little bit some of those key examples here in just a second. Today, uh, there are approximately 150 mystery shopping companies, or I should say companies who conduct mystery shops in the Americas. And, and when I say the Americas there, that 150 is, is largely speaking just to the US and Canada. The association does uh, represent companies in Central America and South America, and that's not included in the 150, but um, largely, like I say, in North America, you've got about 150 companies. Uh, I should have updated this. There's actually only three international chapters because Latin America was at one point its own region and is now rolled into the uh, Americas chapter. And the product is diversified. So, you know, as I mentioned, it started in loss prevention and then it went on to, um, you know, the, what we tend to think of today in terms of mystery shopping is customer experience and progressed from that into all forms of customer measurement. So a lot of these 150 companies do more than just mystery shops. They might do loss prevention programs. They might do focus groups. Um, it's really the association itself used to stand for the Mystery Shopping Providers Association. And it doesn't even go by that anymore because the association's members do so much more than mystery shop. So it's simply just known as MSPA. Uh, doesn't technically stand for anything anymore, just, just a brand, MSPA. Kind of like, um, you know, some folks may or may not know, but IBM was known as International Business Machines for a while. ESPN was Entertainment and Sports Programming Network. We don't really think of those long titles now. We just associate IBM as the computer company, ESPN as the sports network. So MSPA has kind of done the same thing because they've diversified outside of just mystery shops, it's just MSPA Americas. So what is a mystery shop? Well, very simply put, this is the definition that I always use. It's an objective snapshot of a specific past experience. And all of those words are very intentionally chosen for, uh, for a reason to define it. So the first thing, if you look back, we said it's an objective snapshot. So by objective, we mean no personal opinions um, in, in the reporting that we do, unless they're asked for. But your default position when you do a mystery shop is that you're gonna go in undercover and you're gonna review a set of guidelines and then a form that you're gonna fill out afterwards. And for the most part, that form is gonna be 100% factual, 100% objective. Sometimes, and this is more recent in years, Sometimes there are some subjective questions at the end. So after you've laid down all the objective narrative, sometimes you're asked at the end how you might have felt about something. But uh, as a default point of view, you're always looking at mystery shops from the objective perspective. And when you write your report, you want to paint a picture that you experienced. So let's just take a, a, a short time out here and talk about what these reports are for. These reports, once you submit it to the company that you're doing the project for, 
these support these reports will go on to either people at the corporate office or if it's a smaller company it might go to right to the owner a lot of times it's shared with management and basically the reason that a mystery shop company is hired to take projects on and, and assign them out to folks like you or me who would shop is that they want to see what is going on in their operation either when they're not there or they want an objective third party perspective so um, especially if you think about a corporate situation the corporate office sees a lot of statistical data but statistics are hard numbers they're, they're not feelings they're not experiences and so a lot of times what these larger companies are looking for was okay so i see what the sales are i, I see these numbers etc but what is the experience like are they are are the people that we have the team members on the front line are they conducting our business in the manner that we hope and expect and so in order to do that you need to send a person in and record that sometimes uh there's been talk especially in the last 15 years as the internet has evolved and technologies have evolved that uh that mystery shopping will become obsolete because we can now do quick surveys we can now do um you know gig walk assignments where people can you know just quickly do a survey on their phone or maybe you've been to a restaurant and you've seen at the bottom of the receipt hey if you go to this website and you answer a couple questions we'll give you a free cup of coffee or two dollars off on your next visit there was a lot of doom and gloom that that was going to wipe out mystery shopping but it really hasn't and won't because they're uh you know those those surveys and mechanisms as you've probably experienced i know myself um i'll answer maybe two questions maybe uh for free uh or for that type of situation but i'm not going to do a, a 30 page or 30 question um form or 30 question survey so um you're not going to get that information from me. In fact, a lot of times I won't even do the receipt survey. Like, you know, I have to really like the prize <laughs> for filling that out. So, uh, so those things don't quite capture all the detail and the nuances that a mystery shop does. Also, um, those are a lot of those surveys are given after the fact. So the details that the company might be interested in, you wouldn't know until afterwards, after you've already had your meal, you've got your receipt, you've gone home. You've got on your computer and gone to the website to answer the questions. Whereas in a mystery shop, you're gonna have guidelines in advance. You're gonna have the form in advance. So you're gonna know very specifically what you're going in to look for. And then what's really critical here is that what you see, hear, smell, taste, whatever you experience, that you paint that picture vividly for the people who read the report. In other words, they're looking for your writing to indicate uh, how that experience went so so much so that they can through your writing feel like they were in your shoes during that experience so if your writing isn't well then you're not going to give them a great picture of what your experience was like that's why painting that picture is so important and we say um, that it's it's a snapshot of a specific past encounter this is meaning specifically that it's on one individual encounter. So what happened last time doesn't matter. So let's say that you accept a mystery shop assignment to go to your favorite restaurant and that um, you had awful service the day that you did the shop. That should be recorded as it, as it was in real reality for that visit. If the time before you had great service, that shouldn't enter into your report because your report is about this time. Unfortunately, you know that restaurant might um, only have two shops a month and if if you you know take that to 24 a year 23 times out of uh, of those 24 they might have a great report come in but a shopper just happened to be there on a bad day uh, but that's important to them they, they want to know they want to know exactly what happened these people want the straight facts they don't want manipulations uh, they, they don't want to pollute the data with non-relevant experiences or experience that happened at some other time they want the data on that day at that time that you were there based on what personnel was there what was that experience like did the people do these things that we measure them on when you were there at that point in that time and and it's the experience that we're measuring what did you see in here and maybe for instance if it's a restaurant what did you maybe taste and smell 
Now, uh, one thing that people who haven't mystery shopped before, when they get into mystery shopping, they tend to think that when they do restaurant shops, that, um, that there's somewhat of a restaurant critic. That's usually not the case. Again, in more recent years, we're sometimes seeing where uh, restaurant owners or corporate restaurant owners are looking for some feedback on the food. But generally, they're looking for, was the restaurant clean? Were our servers friendly, timely, attentive, those types of things? They're generally not looking for your food review. But sometimes they do ask. Sometimes they will ask, though, things, generic questions like, uh, were hot items served hot? Were cold items served cold? Because obviously, if your entree uh, was cold or lukewarm and it's supposed to be hot, they want to know that. They're usually less interested on, you know, did you like the flavors of it? Um, kind of deal. And part of that too is that they're looking for things that can be homogenized. In other words, they're looking for criteria that they can maintain from location to location. If you think about if you've traveled at all, either around the US or around the world, whenever you go into a, uh, a franchised restaurant, a McDonald's, a Burger King, a Subway, they're pretty much all the same. They might have a little different layout, but pretty much the menus are going to be largely the same. The, the setup of the store is going to be largely the same. That's how you have to kind of measure these bigger corporations with larger uh, numbers of outlets. You're look, looking for ways to keep things consistent. So you have a way to compare with each other. So things like, um, you know, did you like your meal often were not what they were interested in. They're usually interested in, you know, was the, um, was, was the burger made properly? You know, like for instance, Burger King used to do mystery shops, they still do. But one of the criteria on the shops used to be uh, to take a picture, to order a Whopper and to take a picture of it. They wanted to see, was this uh, particular Burger King that you were shopping, was it like sloppily throwing the burgers together or was it putting the burger together in the manner that they expect, consistent with how they expect it across all their brands? So based on what I've said so far, you know, who here might make the best shopper? Um, you've got this person that says, I love to shop. You've got this person here that says, I'm an English teacher. And you've got this person here that says, I've cooked for 12 restaurants. So Michelle, I'm going to put you on the spot. In general, who do you think might make the best shopper here? Well, I'm a little biased, so I'm going with the English teacher. <laughs> Why do you pick the English teacher? Because you talked about how it's important to write about the experience well. So I'm thinking the teacher is going to um, do a real good report. And you're a hundred percent right. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, um, and this is a generality, but uh, the reason I pick these examples is that a lot of times, you know, I've, I've been in this industry, oh gosh, a long time. Um, I started as a shopper. Uh, I was in the, working in the television industry and I was on a plane and I read an article while I was traveling about mystery shopping and I thought that sounds kind of interesting. And so for, you know, I don't know, 10 years I did mystery shopping on the side as, you know, something different to do. It wasn't about the money. It was more about the experiences. And then at one point in my career, there was an opening to run a mystery shop company and I changed careers, got out of television and sports and moved into this industry. And so um, once I got into this side of the table of it, it was interesting because over the years, a lot of people would say, well, what do you do? And I'd say, well, I run a mystery shopping company. And they would say, oh, I, I want to be, how can I be a mystery shopper? I love to shop or I've, I've cooked at all these restaurants. I could be a great mystery shopper. Not necessarily the case because for the people who say I love to shop, what, what, what they're sort of saying generally is I, I love to go out and, and buy things. And that's really not what, what this is. You might have to make some purchases, but it's not about buying things. So if, if what you love is going out and buying things, that's not really the focus here. Likewise, if you say, well, I've cooked for 12 restaurants, so I, I know how a restaurant is supposed to operate. That's not what they want. They don't want experts to come in and tell them what to do. They'll hire a consultancy to do that. What they want is just average, ordinary people, just run-of-the-mill customers coming in, and what was your experience like? And as Michelle correctly pointed out, it's most likely of the three, the English teacher is gonna be best suited approaching this industry 
because what they're interested in is that average ordinary person, what was your experience and can you articulate that in a manner that I can see here and possibly smell and taste, you know, uh, what you did, that that picture was painted for me by your words. What you want to leave out are your personal feelings, unless you're asked, and again, sometimes you might be asked, but generally no, your past experiences at the location, as I mentioned before, comparing to other locations. So again, let's say you're doing a subway and, um, and something goes wrong at this subway or something is different at this subway and you say, you know, this happened at this subway, but, you know, I was at the subway over on Main Street three weeks ago and they did it completely different. They're not interested in that. What they're really interested again is data. They're interested in your data, your, uh, what you observe being quantified into data. So they're looking for data from that location, not a previous place that you've been to. They're not looking for comparisons to other brands. Again, the caveat to all of these things is unless you are asked. So in general, unless asked, you're not going to compare. You're not going to say this, this Burger King puts together uh, the, their burgers better than the, the McDonald's next door, or um, this Burger King serves warmer burgers than the McDonald's next door. Not interested in that. Not interested in your own past personal experiences as well. And they're not really interested in your advice for improvement. And that's where the, the chef might run into issues because, you know, they, they might be very tempted. They, they might see some things like the, you know, the, the pasta had, you know, too much paprika in it or, or too much Cajun spice. That's your opinion. And that's probably an opinion that might be valid based on this person's individual background. But since they're not sending chefs to all of the locations, then that's not really good for the data collection because they want it to be apples to apples. So they want ordinary people's uh, data collection, not experts for the industry. So what does make a great shopper? Well, the very first thing is attention to detail. And that starts at the very beginning. When you look for a mystery shop that you want to take on, it's very important that you look at what is the assignment, like understanding what you're committing to. When does it have to be done by? Because usually you're going to give, be given a specific day or set of dates to do a mystery shop and specific hours that it might have to be done. Some, some can be done at any time they're open. Sometimes it's over lunch and lunch will be defined as you need to walk in the door between 11 and 2. Uh, sometimes it will say anytime during the day short of one hour of closing. In other words, they don't want you doing the mystery shop the last hour that the store is closing uh, or the restaurant's closing. You know, maybe in the restaurant they've given the employees the okay to start doing side work. And so they know that the, um, the attention to the side work might drop their normal customer experience. So you got to be very careful looking at um, what the, the dates and the, the times are. Also the locations. I, I worked at a company earlier in this uh, decade and Chase Bank was the, the location to be shopped. And it was at 101 Main Street. And we had a shopper submit the mystery shopping report. And it was for Wells Fargo Bank at 121 Main Street. So Chase was at one end of the, of the block and Wells Fargo was at the other end. And so the shopper went to the wrong bank and he did the shop, but it wasn't for Wells Fargo. It was supposed to be for Chase, turned it in and we couldn't use it and, uh, and really had quite a meltdown over it. But at the end of the day, like this is just not a usable shop for us. Wells Fargo wasn't even our client. Um, the, the assignment was to shop Chase and so therefore the shop could not be used, he could not be paid, and we had to quickly reschedule the shop and send somebody in. So even things like the location, all that stuff, you need to pay attention to detail right off the bat. Of course, once you're doing the shop, detail becomes equally important then as well. Reliability is key as well. Um, once you commit to a shop, then the company is counting on you to do it, to do it properly, and to do it on time and submit it on time. And the fastest way to be taken off of the go-to list for a mystery shop company is to miss deadlines. Following directions without deviation is important. 
because uh, sometimes you might look at the form and you'll see a question on there and you'll go, well, that's a stupid question. I'm not even sure why I have to answer that. Um, and the questions sometimes say, you might get a question like, um, were the uh, restrooms clean, yes or no? And then there might be a follow-up question that says, if no, please explain. And you might say, well, they weren't. I don't understand why I have to explain it. Well, because they want more detail. And so again, neither you as the shopper nor the company that you're doing the project for really have any ability to deviate from what those instructions are. Those instructions come from the client. And if you think about it, if you sort of step back at a macro level, the client is saying to the company that you're doing the project for, we, Mr. Company, Mrs. Company, we want you to get this information for us. That company turns around and then they contract that out to you to go get it. So again, it's not what you want to do. It's not what even the mystery shop company wants to do. It's what the client is requiring. And as I mentioned in the last example about the bank, if you fail to deliver what they're asking for, then they're not obligated to pay the mystery shopping company and the mystery shopping company is not gonna pay you. What's even worse is, is if you fail to deliver, um, you could be putting that entire account in jeopardy for the mystery shop company. It's the one part of this business that, to be honest, over the years, I've never felt very comfortable with, is that uh, mystery shop companies hire literally tens of thousands of shoppers, all of whom they're placing the trust of their business into their hands, relatively of strangers. And it only takes a couple bad apples who fail to follow the guidelines, who don't turn... Um, reports in on time, or in the worst case scenario, turn fraudulent reports in, um, that can absolutely ruin the relationship between the company and the client. And there's just not time or dollars to do background checks on everybody. And even if you did, that doesn't mean somebody still couldn't miss a deadline or turn a fraudulent report in. So it's an industry that is very much largely built on trust. As we've talked about already several times, you need to be able to articulate well. Um, respecting deadline. We've talked about the timeliness issue there. And then it's also important to be available for follow-up after the fact. Sometimes you really do try to, you know, almost in every instance, I would say, um, shoppers really do try to do the best uh, to follow the directions, but maybe something in their writing was unclear. And so the company that, that receives the report to send to the client, they can't send that report in as you wrote it because it's a little too vague. And so they may need to reach out to you and say, when you said this, what exactly did you mean? I'm a little confused. I want to tighten that writing up for you. And so it's really important that you're also available after the fact, if needed. Um, you know, I would say maybe, depending on the project, uh, maybe 10% of the time, a, uh, a quality control person or an editor needs to come back to the shopper and get some clarification. Um, and, you, and again, if you want to get as many assignments as possible, you don't want to be having that happen to you very often. Uh, definitely uh, quality control people will start to see a pattern if, well, when we, ever, when we use this shopper, this shopper always uh, requires us to follow up and get more detail. Maybe we find some other shoppers first who we don't have that experience with. So the, the more that you need to get those follow-up calls, the less likely you're gonna be a go-to shopper in the future. So how does the whole process work? So it all starts with the uh, MSP, which um, again is sort of an acronym that used to stand for Mystery Shopping Provider. We still just call it MSP now. So the MSP or the research company, they contract with the client. So uh, a company may contract with Best Buy. Then Best Buy will tell them, this is what we wanna know. And so the Mystery Shopping Company they will go ahead and they will create a form and then they'll run that past Best Buy and say, do these questions give you the data that you want? And Best Buy may say, take this out, add this one, change the wording on this one until they get to a point where they go, yep, that's the form that we want. Go ahead and implement it. At that time, the mystery shop company will then go out to its database of shoppers. And I'll tell you how to get in that database if, in, in a few moments. And they'll offer that project out. They may, uh, depending on the size of the project, they may send it out in a mass email blast and it you know, could be like first in wins. So if, if uh, the Best Buy down the street from you, you wanna do and it's available, 
If you're the first person to claim it, uh, they may hand it to you. If it's a smaller project, especially if it's a, a very specialty project, they may have a list of shoppers in that area that we've had proven experience with. Let's go to these people first, and then we're willing to take some new shoppers on if we can't fill them uh, with people that we know who've already performed for us. If you go back to that trust thing that I talked about, um, you can, I think you can see that every time a scheduler needs to bring a new shopper on, it's a little dicey, it's a little scary because that shopper has no record with that company and they're just hoping that they're gonna be able to perform and that they're a good shopper. So a lot of times schedulers do like to go back to people who they've used before because they have a track record. That might make it sound like it's hard to break into a company and with certain companies, it probably is the case, but uh, a lot of shops go out and so schedulers are always looking to bring some fresh faces in. The other thing is, is that you can't keep sending the same shopper to do the same assignments at the same locations. So the, the mystery shopping companies are uh, typically looking for new faces to bring in to mix it up a little bit. So they've offered the project out to the independent contractors. That's what the IC stands for, the independent contractors. The independent contractors perform the shop, then they submit it to the MSP. The MSP um, makes sure it's good to go. Then they send it to the client. Once it's good to go, the client reviews the data. As long as they don't reject the shop, then everybody gets paid. They pay the mystery shopping company, the mystery shopping company then pays the shopper. The biggest thing again here is to follow the guidelines. And I've just thrown this picture up because I just can't stress it enough. Um, the, the shops that get rejected, the shops that eat up so much time are when shoppers just don't read the guidelines or they don't, they miss something. Um, so I just can't stress enough reading the guidelines and then reviewing the form before you do it are so important if you become a mystery shopper. I wanna give you an example of some writing here. We, we offer 20 some certification courses at MSPA. This is a, an example that is in the professional report writing course that we offer. So um, this is some language out of a report where a shopper did a fine dining mystery shop report and they were asked to describe their entree. And so this is the first example of the writing. It says, my entree was served hot with potatoes and a side vegetable. Now, if you look at the picture, you see the, the entree, um, you can see that it was a, a steak, there was potatoes, there was a vegetable. This is an absolutely factual comment. But my point here is it's not as descriptive as it could be. And so this is when we talked about painting the picture and well articulating, um, you know, the what you see, what you smell, all that sort of stuff to put somebody in those shoes. So here's a better version of it. My meat came with mashed potatoes and a couple pieces of asparagus. Do you see how we've made that more um, descriptive? It's not just an entree. We've now described that, that we, we ordered meat and it came with mashed potatoes, not just potatoes, they were mashed potatoes and not just a side vegetable. It was a couple pieces of asparagus, but we can go even better there. My steak, so we described now what the steak, what the meat was, my steak was hot and served on a plate with some steaming mashed potatoes and six pieces of seasoned asparagus. Again, we've gotten more descriptive. And the best one is my ribeye, now we've further defined what the steak was, was served sizzling on a hot plate with a mound of fluffy steaming mashed potatoes and six perfectly cooked stems of asparagus, which were dressed in a delicious garlic butter sauce. Not every uh, industry, needs that much description, but I will tell you a fine dining shop is gonna be all over the fourth one. That's what they wanna see. They wanna know exactly what you ordered, exactly how it was presented. And if you close your eyes and if I read that to you, you could picture in your mind this plate coming with the sizzling meat, uh, the fluffy mound of potatoes, and you could almost taste the garlic butter sauce from your own experience. This is what I talk about when I say paint the picture so that the person reading the report gets the feel of what you experienced when you were there that day. So, um, so how do you get started? How does it work? Well, as I said, there are about 150 companies in North America that are doing mystery shopping. You would go to each one of those companies that you want to shop for. Unfortunately, there's no sort of mass sign up, um, but you would go to the company and you would 
there's, there's, there's always something on their website that says apply to be a shopper. You would go to that button, you would click on that and you would fill out their application. Now that would put you in their database. Once you're in their database, there's two ways that you might find shops. The first is that they might do a mass mailing out whenever there's a, um, an opportunity. Sometimes some companies are doing texts if you opt, to opt in on texting. The other way is to go to their website and look at their uh, what we call opportunity boards in this industry. It's basically a listing of all their open projects. Um, once you see something that you like, the instructions will tell you how to request that project. So it might be clicking on a link, it might be calling into the scheduling department. And so that's what you would do. And then you'll find out whether that assignment is still available. And if it is, whether it's been assigned to you, and then you go ahead and you do it. So these are some of the projects that you might get in this industry. <clears throat> We've talked a lot about the basic mystery shops. That's, uh, and CX stands for customer experience. So the basic customer experience mystery shops. So you're just gonna go into a restaurant, you're gonna go into a store, and you're gonna just pretend to be a customer browsing and, or eating and, uh, and you know, very, uh, in a clandine, clandestine manner, taking observations, making mental notes. Now you can actually, if you're careful, put some of your notes on your phone. You can send it to yourself as an email or use the notepad. Uh, before cell phones, this was uh, very hard to do because you can't take your forms or guidelines with you on the shop. Obviously that would give you away. Uh, you can never say I'm here doing a mystery shop ever. Uh, that, would, that, pro that report would be thrown out. So it used to be a lot harder to, especially on shops that required a lot of attention to detail, it used to be a lot harder to remember all that detail. We used to have to do certain tricks. So for instance, if it was a restaurant, we might um, bring a newspaper with us and uh, turn it to the crossword puzzle page and sort of pretend like we were doing a crossword puzzle over dinner. But meanwhile, in the blocks, we were writing down details that we would later put into a report. Today with cell phones being around, um, you know, people texting at the table, you can be taking all kinds of notes. And as long as they don't see your screen, you'll never get caught. So much easier to do that today. Then you have something called compliance shops. These, these are also mystery shops that you um, are not looking for customer experience, but you're looking for compliance to regulations. So um, for instance, banks do a lot of compliance shops you uh, would go to the bank and you might request a money order or you might apply for a credit card or you might go through the initial process, not closing the loan, but the initial process of getting a mortgage or a loan. And there, as you probably know from being a notary, there are certain procedures, documents that have to come uh, to the applicant in a sequential order. And uh, you're really just testing to see whether the uh, mortgage loan officer or the, the teller is doing what they're supposed to be doing if they're following the regulations. The banks would rather find that out from you than have the government come in and find them for, for not doing the proper things. Then you have things called integrity shops. Uh, these largely come in two areas. That is uh, selling cigarettes and alcohol to underage minors and the other would be cash handling and pouring in bars. So um, for, for the first one of those, they're typically looking for people who look young, who are over 20, 21 or over, but who look like they could be teenagers and send them in to try to buy cigarettes or buy alcohol. And um, for the bar shops, you're typically looking again to see sometimes the under 21 thing, but a lot of times you're looking to see cash handling is um, cash being all cash being put in the drawer or is it being uh, pocketed? Um, you're also looking to see whether drinks are being poured properly uh, by measure or whether alcohol is being wasted. Um, so those are a couple types of integrity shops. Competitor shops are um, where pretty much it sound, is what it sounds like. You're looking at competitors to the, the company that is the client. So for instance, McDonald's might be the client, but the mystery shops that they are contracting for might be to do Wendy's and Burger King. They want information on their competitor, not necessarily on themselves. 
And then you have uh, recorded shops, video and audio only shops. These shops, you're going to be doing your basic mystery shop, where the only difference is, is you're recording the whole thing. Now, uh, as you probably know, there are different laws in, in the states. 13 states are two-party states. The rest are one-party state. So this is all handled in advance by the mystery shop company. Um, they will tell you if it's a two-party state, for instance, what we used to require is that there is a certification that comes from the client that says all of our employees have signed a consent form to be video or audio recorded at any time. It's part of their handbook when they sign up. But um, in one party states, only one person needs to know they're being recorded and that would be you as the shopper, you know, um, so that that's uh, not an issue. The recorded shops typically pay a lot more and that is because they're more complicated as you can imagine. There's one other um, shop I didn't list on here that's called a reveal shop. It doesn't happen as much, but it sometimes happens. And that's where you're gonna reveal yourself as a shopper. It's the only time you're allowed to do that. So how does that come into play? Well, I, I did one years ago for Coca-Cola and uh, Coca-Cola was doing a promotion with Waffle House. And so when you would go into a Waffle House, the server, when you, made your order, the server was supposed to ask you specifically, would you like a Coke with that? They weren't supposed to say, what would you like to drink? Can I get you something to drink? They were very specifically supposed to say, would you like a Coke with that? And so the shop was to go in and order something and see if the server asked specifically, would you like a Coke with that? As soon as that was done, you were supposed to reveal yourself and say, Hopefully you said, congratulations, um, I'm working for uh, Coca-Cola today on behalf of Coca-Cola. And um, you were being tested to see if you would recommend Coca-Cola and you did. And I'm pleased to provide this gift card for you, uh, congratulations. If they didn't win, which is always the harder one, you're supposed to say, gee, I'm really sorry. You know, Coca-Cola has this promotion with Waffle House and you were supposed to offer me a uh, Coke. And so uh, I think they did, give them like a smaller gift card, sort of like a thanks for playing, but it was like the difference between like a $5 gift card and a $50 gift card. Um, so anyway, so that's what a, a reveal shop would be. It's the only time that you're able to reveal that you're mystery shopping. Okay, so compensation, what can you get out of this? Well, again, this is not, as I said earlier, a get rich quick scheme by any means. You're gonna pick up pocket change. Um, there are a few people that I know of who do nothing but mystery shop. They literally, work for as many companies as they can and they do what we call route shopping which is they will just drive for anywhere from two to three days to two to three weeks around the state or around the country and just keep banging out mystery shops as they go and they'll be smart about it i mean they've been doing this for a while they'll do things like um uh, make sure that they book hotel mystery shops and so as they're traveling they're not only shopping the hotel but but the expense of the hotel is being covered by that shop. So um, the fees range really, again, from nothing, uh, and we'll talk about reimbursements and opportunities here, and you do get that, of course, uh, to, you know, on the high end, I mean, your average mystery shop's gonna be $15, uh, 15 to $20. Depending on how simple or how complex it is, is where the, the fees um, change, because it's just like any other piece of economics, where the more difficult it is, the harder it is to attract people. So you have to put more money towards it. Uh, gas stations and convenience stores. So just going to the gas station, checking out very quickly, is it clean? Going inside, checking the bathroom and then making a nominal purchase. You're gonna get reimbursed the purchase and maybe a couple dollars. That's real easy. You can knock that out in five minutes. Um, not at all hard to fill. Going to a theme park, like two tickets to Disney or um, something like that, uh, is not going to pay anything. It's, it's basically going to be reimbursing your admission. Um, and it, it may or may not be difficult for you to do that shop. Like, for instance, depending on what the criteria is, um, it, it may be a pretty involved shop. So you have to really make sure again that this is something you wanna do because it may involve you being at Disney all day long and it may take you most of the day to do the shop. Now you can have some fun in between, but it may say, okay, 
You need to do a lunch shop while you're there at this restaurant. You need to go check the wait times from three to five o'clock at these 10 attractions. And then you may need to do a dinner shop while you're there at seven o'clock at this restaurant. Now in between all that stuff, you're free to enjoy the park, but, um, but it may be a day long shop. So you have to make sure that that's something that you really want to commit to or go, no, if I'm, if I'm going to go, I want to enjoy the day. I don't want to have to break it up by doing all these shops. Um, other shops that tend to pay higher are auto dealership shops, new home shops where you're going to need to spend a good hour or so, and you might have to do a test drive or you might have to do a walk through some model homes. Um, we, uh, not we, at a, so I wear several hats. I still have my own um, mystery shopping company. And, uh, and of course, we, I have another company that manages MSPA, as I said before, um, but we at the mystery shopping company um, just uh, completed a project in Canada for, um, for loans. You had to get a, a loan. Um, you didn't have to actually go through and have it funded, but you did have to have your credit uh, report run. So in order to incentivize people to do that, we were paying $100 a shop. The shop wasn't that hard, but it's a couple points off of your credit report. So uh, we, we paid a high uh, honorarium for that. So they really depend. Uh, if you're going to do a dinner shop, you might get a small stipend. Most dinner shops, restaurant shops are going to be reimbursement only because you're getting the meal. Uh, any, anything that you have to spend, though, is, is always reimbursed as long as you spend it on the right thing and you didn't go over budget. And then finally, um, kind of like the Disney situation, a lot of times you have some opportunities as well. So uh, we, we put shoppers on walking tours in Orlando, and there's no compensation for that. There's no fee for that. But uh, similar to the Disney thing, the, um, the shopper and a guest get to go on the walking tour for free. And it's actually a pretty easy um, survey at the end that they do. It's not even, it's more of a survey than a mystery shop. So, um, so there's no fee for that, but they get, they get the two tours. The, the, probably the best story I can share, and this is a very rare story, but just to tell you that it does happen. Um, another mystery shopping company that we're friends with said, we need um, people to do some shops, Rolex shops, um, in the Caribbean, and can you help us with this? Now, before you get too excited, we didn't get to keep the Rolexes. Uh, we didn't even get to buy them. They were just try them on. But where it was kind of cool was there, uh, these Rolex shops were largely in the cruise ship ports in the Caribbean. And so in most of the places in the Caribbean, the company was able to find people to go, you know, re local residents to go to the port and do the shop. In one particular town, Falmouth, Jamaica, local residents are not allowed into the uh, port area unless they are badged and working there, which would make them ineligible to shop because, you know, knowing, knowing the people there. So the only way to do the shop was to come into the island off of a cruise ship. And, and the only cruise ship that went there was a Royal Caribbean seven night cruise. And so, uh, we, we personally did the shop and, uh, you know, Royal Caribbean, uh, we took that seven night cruise that was paid for by Rolex just so we could go in and do that one shop because it was the only way to get that data. So once in a while you get some of those extreme opportunities like that. But um, the theme parks and, and attractions areas is an area that typically all are shopped. And if you can find the company that's doing them, you can usually get a good day at the park. And, you know, those Again, it's, it's not just the reimbursement for the tickets, but the meals that you have to get. Sometimes it's take pictures, like anything that they ask you to do and spend money on, um, you're going to get reimbursed for. Now, there's just a couple quick things here, and then I'll save a few moments for questions. The, the major thing you want to be careful of is about being scammed. As you can see um, on the screen here, this looks like a very authentic check. It is not. It is totally fake. And so what scammers do is they send these very, um, you know, authentic looking checks out to people and usually the same instructions, which I'm going to tell you about. But it's, it's very sad because at MSPA, we usually get an email or two a day from people questioning or reporting this type of a scam. And those are the people who just reach out to us. That doesn't include, sadly, the people who um, we're taken advantage of and are too embarrassed to reach out or people who don't know MSPA exists. 
Uh, and there is nothing we can do about it, by the way, other than to ask them to report it to the F, uh, FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. But this is how the scam goes. They send a stranger a check, usually anywhere from about $1,500 to $3,000. They tell them to deposit that check and then use those proceeds to go buy gift cards from, and it's usually Best Buy and Walmart, and then to um, either send the gift cards back or to uh, keep the merchandise, but then shop Western Union and of the $3,000 that was in the check, send back uh, $2,000. So spend $500 at Best Buy, $500 at Walmart, reimbursing yourself, and then send us the rest back. So just keep in mind, folks, nobody is ever going to send a stranger that they've never met before thousands of dollars in terms of a check. Um, that should be the first tip off. But the checks do look authentic. And so uh, what happens is when people fall for this scam, the check looks good, they deposit it, and then they send the gift cards back or they wire the, the rest of the money back. And then after the fact, they find out that the check bounced and basically the person is out that money. So this is something to completely avoid. So how do you make sure that you get connected with a, um, you know, the right companies if you're gonna shop? Well, again, MSP Americas is the official industry trade association. We've got the, the service companies. We have membership for independent contractor shoppers, vendors, and academics who study customer experience. And its purpose is to protect the members, grow the brand, create value for the members, um, and grow the whole membership as a whole. Um, we do have a shopper benefit class or class of membership here for $30 a year. It gives you access to the industry leadership. It gives you access to industry certifications and a discount on them. Uh, anybody can take the certifications, but if, if you um, are what we call an IC Pro member, you get discounts to that. There's also an annual conference called ShopperFest that is just for the independent contractors each year. You get a discount on that. You get access to the Opportunity Board, which is um, the industry's sort of job board. So in addition to companies having their own Opportunity Board, they can also go to the uh, MSP America's website and post opportunities. So maybe you're not signed up with this company that posted on the MSPA board. You see those opportunities and decide that you might want to sign up for that with that company. And then we have something called Enjoy My Deals, which is a sort of a national discount program, saving you money on hotels and travel and restaurants and tickets, all that sort of stuff. So, um, so how, how, and this is our IC Pro paid membership. We do have a basic membership that's absolutely free. Uh, you don't get any of the, you get, you can still take certifications. You don't get the discount. You can still go to ShopperFest. You can't, you don't get the discount. You can still access the opportunity board, but the IC Pro members see the assignments first for 24 hours. So if you really want to get the shops in your area, you probably want to become a pro member. That way you would see them first. Um, if you're just a basic member, somebody could have already taken that shop by the time you're able to see it 24 hours later. But getting signed up, the best thing to do to protect yourself is to go to the MSPA Americas website. It's mspa-americas.org, mspa-americas.org. And it, there's a button that says service providers. You click on that button, that will last every, list every member of MSPA that's a service provider. Each one of these service providers have been vetted and uh, we know that they're legitimate and um, they are bound by a code of ethics that if they default on, they get removed from the association. So anybody on there is a legitimate company. Now you might be tempted to go, oh, okay, I, I see CX Orlando is a legitimate company. I'll just go to their website. We recommend you don't do that. On the MSPA website, there will be a link. Click directly from the MSPA website because the scammers have gotten smart and they steal logos um, and, and create phony websites. Um, so the best way to do it is only go to one of our members' websites through the MSPA link, at least at first, and then you can bookmark it uh, once you actually get to the right page. But this makes sure, helps you make sure you're at the right place. And uh, Michelle, I will turn it back to you because we're almost at the top of the hour and that's, uh, 
that's sort of the very quick rundown of MSPA. I really appreciate you, Rich. Was there any last comments you'd like to make um, before we close out or you think you hit it all? Uh, I would just say, as you and I talked earlier about COVID, COVID has really put a hurt on the industry because as companies are not doing as much business, they're also reducing their customer experience programs. And, um, you know, that's going to take a little while to come back. So you probably, if you were to become a mystery shopper today, you won't see the assignments in quantity that you would have in January. But uh, I think with the vaccine coming and herd immunity growing, I think we'll be back in full force by midsummer. All right. I appreciate you sure. hitting on everything that's important. And um, those of you who joined us, I hope this was helpful information. Um, again, I had a blast being a mystery shopper. Um, hearing Rich today brought back some real fond memories. And Rich, I went to the wrong store once. Um, thankfully, I realized it right when I started to work on my report. So um, I was able to get my tail back to the right store. And um, But it was a good lesson for me. Yeah, I've done it too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Attention to detail. This was exactly what I had hoped to get, Rich. So thank you again for your time today. We greatly appreciate it. Before we Thanks, end, Rich. anyone um, who's still here, any questions for Rich that you'd like to ask? Carla, Maisha, Cynthia, Carrie, if so, unmute, and we'll take your question. No? All right, then. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. And Rich, I'll be back in touch. Okay, it sounds good. We'll look forward to seeing you shop again. All right. Thank Bye you. Bye, guys. Have a great Bye. holiday.